let me uh, do a little housekeeping. Uh, I'll do this. Um, it has my email in the bulletin, but due to unforeseen circumstances, I had to change it. So it says, past Tim, if you'll just put Hackett there, past Tim, Hackett at bellsouth, I mean at gmail.com, you will get me. Um, we've had to do a, quite a few changing on some things since I've been here, but that's all right. So I know none of you got that, but uh, if you got it, if you will text me, Tess, Tess, I'll appreciate it. How many are sad this morning? How many are mad this morning? <laughs> How many are bad this morning? How many are glad this morning? Amen. Aren't you glad that you have friends? Aren't you glad that you have life and health and strength? But aren't you glad you have a Savior? If you have your Bibles open with please to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Powerful passage of Scripture. Um, I want to just this morning kind of give us a description of the first church. Now folks, I do believe with all my heart if we don't want to have church, if we want to follow church, if we want to be the church, wouldn't it be great if we know what the church is? Wouldn't it be great to know why Jesus Christ started the church? Wouldn't it be great to have a description of what the church ought to be like? And I believe with all my heart, we need to sometimes look back at what God intends us to be and do as a church. What's the will of God for us at the church, at the real church? What happened in the first church that is significant that we ought to also have happening every week in our church here today. Notice Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Now understand, this is the beginning of the first church. Notice what the book of Acts says. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. So you see here, they were born again, and then they were baptized, and then began to be brought into the church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need of. And they continually daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their bread with gladness and single-heartedness, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So as I look at this passage of Scripture, it amazes me what was going on in the first church. I would say that there was spiritual growth, and that spiritual growth equals spiritual maturity. Otherwise, what we're talking about is strength. They began to grow in the Lord, to become strong in the Lord. What happens? Which equals spiritual traits. Then they discovered their spiritual gifts and began to use those spiritual gifts to work in the church and follow through as they began to witness to people all around them which equals spiritual capability, which really means the ability, the capacity to serve God. Now understand, God, when he brings us into his, his house or his, his way, when he brings us into his lifestyle, otherwise when he, we're born again, when we're saved, guess what he does to us? He literally trains us. He trains us to spiritual maturity. God never, ever just brings you in just to use you right away. He brings you in to train you how to be used in the right way. And what happens so many times in churches, people jump into the fire, so to speak, but they want to do something, but they don't know how to do it. They want to do something, but they lack the ability to know how to do that in their Christian walk with God. And so many times in many churches, a person gets saved on Sunday, the following Sunday, they're a Sunday school teacher. They're saved on Sunday, the following Sunday, they're a deacon. This happened to me, I was saved, and two weeks later, I was the pastor. I didn't understand why people didn't understand me. Someone this week, and I won't mention names, they told me to slow down. I'm not going to look over there, the man said it, but anyway, uh, so I'm going to try to slow down this morning so everybody can understand. Open your Bibles. No. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3. Listen, I enjoy my Christianity. I enjoy life. I, I'm so glad that God saved me. I can't get over it. Someone said, you're a jokester. No, I'm just, saved. I'm just a saved person that so enjoys God. I love life. I just enjoy being in life. I enjoy being around people. I love people. My wife and I love people. I love my wife. Married 52 years. I've, someone's married 57 this coming week. That's a great time of life because you love your wife and each other more than you ever did before. It's a precious time in life. I said that all to just go on, okay? 
2 Timothy 3, 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, is one of the signs of the last days. In fact, we're not only there, but we've been in the last days for a long time. It's been a progress. Slowly and slowly, we see deterioration. Slowly and slowly, we see things that we'd never dreamed ever happen. In the last five years of my ministry, I'm going to tell you something. I've seen some tremendous change, not for the good. I'm dealing with people now with the things and problems they have that I've never dealt with them in my life. I'm beginning to have to deal with things as a pastor that you wouldn't even believe. It is a quickly, and it's, always, it's in the church too. We always talk about the sin out there when we ought to begin to deal with the sin right here. There's as much sin in the church as there is outside the church. The problem is we just don't realize it. We just don't see it. Because many people hide their sins. But let me tell you something, you can't hide them from God. Many people walk in the church and they praise the Lord and they sing and they're in the choir. They're everywhere. But ladies and gentlemen, their heart is not right with God. And eventually you'll see the truth. The truth will always be made known. In fact, think about it. They have a form of godliness. That's what he's saying. However, they have rejected the power to help them complete their form of godliness. They have a form of it, but they do not have the power of it because they don't have the power to help them become godly people. They rejected that power. They have it, but they reject it. God gives it to us, but ladies and gentlemen, we have to receive it. We have to say, God, this is what you gave me, and I will take this. I will take the steps of faith that you have given me the ability and the power to do. In fact, they could be godly, but they refuse to be godly. Uh, they know, but they don't know how to act, or they won't act it. They know what to do, but they don't want to act that way. They don't live that way. In fact, they, they know what to do, but they don't want to do it. And they have the ability to do it, but they don't have the will to do it. Folks, everyone in this church has a gift. And everyone in this church has the ability through the power of God to do what God has called you to do. Folks, do you know what your spiritual gift is? Every one of us has a spiritual gift. And if you try to serve God outside of your spiritual gift, you'll never do all that God wants you to do and fulfill within your spiritual gift. There was an old saying that used to say in the revival days, especially in the South, I was born in the fire, but I can't stand the smoke. Today, as Christians say, I was born in the smoke and I can't stand the fire. Otherwise, smoke is the after effects of the fire. You can't get much out of the after effects. If you don't have the real thing, you just got the smoke of it, you're not going far. And many churches are living in the smoke of the fire. They don't have the fire, they, they just have the results of the fire. And many times they make up the fire. They try to bring down the fire in their own efforts, in their own programs. In Revelation chapter 2, the Lord tells the church of Ephesus that he had something against them. Notice what he says, verses 4 through 6 of chapter 2 of the book of Revelation. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. They had somehow, they have somewhat left their first love, Jesus Christ. They started with him, but something happened that they began to slowly walk away from him. They got cold and they got indifferent towards the things of God, the things of Jesus Christ. They had been very close to him at one time, but now they have drifted away. Now what they had is no longer there. Now the joy of the Lord is no longer there. The power of God is now seeping away from them. They got a leak. It is a slow leak that's slowly draining them of what God has for them. God has imparted into them his power and his strength and his Holy Spirit. In fact, their closeness now is a long distance. We don't realize that we're backsliding until we're at the end of it. Backsliding is a slow process. We don't realize that we're walking away from God until we get almost to the end of our ropes. So many people will call me and say, Preacher, will you pray for me? I went to the doctor. I, I went to a psychiatrist. I went here and I went there. And, I went, and, I, and I, all I have left is to turn to God. Who should have went to first? That is a sign that you're not where you ought to be with God. What would happen in your marriage is the last person you talk to every day is your wife. Good night. And she'll tell you good night. They were not excited anymore. They were not thrilled. They didn't want to come to church. They no longer desired what God desired. In fact, some th something was missing, and they didn't even know it was missing. In fact, the matter is they desire to serve, they desire to work, and they desire to, to, to do the will of God slowly faded away. Do you remember a time in your life where you used to love the Lord? Do you remember a time in your life when you used to be close to God? Do you remember a time in your life that you're on fire for God? You want to do everything. I remember when I first got saved. Man, I joined everything. I even joined the ladies' auxiliary. I was excited. 
You know I am an honorary member of a ladies' dog auxiliary? Yeah. I don't show up. They may be an honorary, honorary member as long as I don't show up. In the early church, the New Testament church, we find the traits that God Almighty has admonished the church, the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, two to return to. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. And the angel of the church was the messenger of the church, the pastor of the church in Ephesus right. These are the words of him that holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampsticks was the church. I know your deeds and your hard work and your, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have per persevered and have endured the hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Isn't that a great description of a good church? Isn't it a great description of what we ought to be? Isn't it a great description? And you think, and you read that up to that point, and you say, man, this is a church that's got it. This is a church that's doing what God wants them to do. Next verse. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstick from its place. Can you imagine Here's a church doing everything, everything everybody thinks a church ought to do. Here's a church that seems like it's going for God, working for God. They're persevering. <coughs> They're doing everything it seems like God wanted them to do. But what happened? They were doing it in the flesh. Somewhere along the line, <coughs> they changed gears. They left what God had in store for them, what God wanted them to be, how God wanted him to, them to serve him. They were recognized in evil. They were recognized false doctrine but all doing it in the flesh. And somewhere along the line, they turned from the spirit to the flesh. They saw what God did in the spirit, how powerful he was, and how the church was growing. Then they realized, you know what? I can do that better on my own without even saying that. They started going through the emotions of church. And without even realizing, they were away from God. They lost God. In fact, some of the church probably said, why do we need God? Because we're doing it on our own. That's sad. I think we need to examine the early church days so that we can see why the believers turned the world upside down. I don't know about you, but don't you want to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ? Amen. Don't you be, want to be a fireball for God? Don't you want this church to be all that God wants it to be? This is a great church. You're great people. <clears throat> I know you voted me as pastor. That's a question mark. I understand that. But I do know this. I fell in love with you the first day. My wife fell in love with you the first day. And we really believe that God has this church here for a purpose. And God has some wonderful things in this church. I do know this also. That if God's going to work in any church, God, the old devil himself, is going to stop it. Try to stop it. Try to break it up. Try to cause confusion. But I want to tell you what. Greater is he that's in us than he is in the Lord. Amen. We better understand that. The first trait I see of these seven, and this is what we need. Number one. There were true conversions. Verse 41. Read what verse 41 says. In verse 41 it says, And they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. They had true conversions. Conversion. Now listen to me. You know it's possible to come to this altar and pray the sinner's prayer and not get saved? There are so many people that have come to an altar and they prayed and they got up and were the same. Some people, it's like foxhole decisions. You know, a man gets in the service or a woman, and they're in a foxhole, and they cry out, God, if you get me out of here, I'll serve you the rest of my life. And then he gets them out of there, and they forget God. And so there's a lot of people that come to you all. You know, prayer is therapeutic. It helps you. Psychiatrists tell us, uh, sociologists tell us even, that when you pray, whether you're saved or not, it, it helps. It soothes the soul. It's simply you're talking out your problems. You're relieving your problems. You're releasing your problems. But folks, when you pray to God and you cry out to God genuinely, I want to tell you something, and you get saved, you get right with God, there is a change in your life. You stop doing things and you start doing things. You stop loving things, you start loving things. You stop believing things, you start believing things. It, there is a total difference. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. When you get right with God, everybody knows it. It begins to show your wife knows it. Your children know it. The people at work know it. You can't stop being a Christian. 
if you're truly on fire for God, if you're truly a saved person, it just comes out. It just goes, it's so exciting. When you sit beside a real saved person, well, listen, when Brother Cup gets full, Sister Saucer gets some. I'm telling you, it's just it's that way. <laughs> so these are, listen, they receive the teaching of God's word of Scripture with joy and enthusiasm. That's why they got enthused. That's why they got saved. In fact, today there's a change in the church membership. Now they want to be entertained. Now they want to be literally con not converted. They want to be entertained. Not converted, they want to feel better. They want to feel good. Today our worship has turned into feeling to feel what it feels good. It's called preference worship. Now we don't have it here. I believe it with all my heart. I watch the, the, uh, the worship team, praise team, whatever you call yourself. But it's both are the same. When they were singing this morning, they were singing not to themselves and not to us. They were singing to God. Yes. They were worshiping God, not because they preferred that, but because they loved that and they wanted to let God know how wonderful he is to us. Yes. The joy of the Lord was in them, and they sang as unto the Lord. They didn't sing up here to entertain you. They sang up there to get the glory of God, to revere, revere God's glory to all of us. Yes. I love that. Listen, I'd rather hear someone sing who loves the Lord and can't carry a tune than someone th sings, has every tune right, but they do not love God. There's a world of difference. In fact, if a pastor preaches the word of God in some churches today with power and enthusiasm and conviction, the average church member is offended. I pastored in church that every time I preached on Sunday morning, there was a meeting called by the deacons to jump on me and what I preached about every Sunday morning. And, and so one day, we, they called the meeting in my office, and I said, y'all go ahead and meet by yourself. i got to eat dinner. And it was a long dinner because they hadn't been back since. <laughs> <laughs> the church member doesn't really what happened. How in the world can we start say to ourselves or tell anybody else that we're truly a child of God and it takes a hard time to get us here on Sunday morning or Sunday school or Wednesday night or Sunday night? How in the world can we say we love God and we don't want to come to his house? How in the world we say we love God and we don't want to be around God's people? There's something wrong with that. But in the early church, folks, they wanted. In fact, they were loving God with joy and enthusiasm, and they were loving God with excitement. Folks, you get around someone that loves God, truly loves God, and truly is converted. They're exciting. They want to tell you about one person, that's Jesus Christ. You know, the blind man said, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it happened. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. Amen. Sometimes we don't have to know all the theology, the theology of the Bible. We just need to know the God of the Bible. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. I've been attacked by the Missouri allergies. <clears throat> and they're rough. Welcome, Welcome home. Huh? <laughs> you know, it's amazing to me that a new convert in this passage automatically got baptized. The pastor didn't have to chase him around and say, you've got to be baptized. It said they were saved, and immediately they were baptized. They wanted the whole thing. They wanted it all. They wanted the whole thing. I mean, folks, let me tell you something. They were excited. It said then they gladly received the word, were baptized with joy, with great anticipation. The pastor didn't have to beg them to be baptized. They had a desire to be baptized. Folks, it would be great to work with people who have a desire to be work, work for God. They had a desire to be in church. And all the believers were get together. Listen, there were great excitement in being in the church. Don't you love a church? Don't you want your church to be like every Sunday you just anticipate something great? You just anticipate that God's going to do something great. You don't know what he's going to do, but you want to be there when he does it. Can I tell you something? It's hard to explain what God is doing in the church if you're not there when he does it. If you miss it when God does it, I can't, I can't tell you. I can't explain it to you because you've got to be here to really see what God's doing. You ever been in a great service? You ever been in a service God is moving? And then you go tell somebody else, they don't, they don't understand it because they weren't there. Hey, I was there when I got saved. I was there when I got baptized. I was there when God moved my heart. I was there when God had called me to preach. And everybody said, called you to preach? God, help us. Is the church that bad? No, God's that good. They were always wanting to assemble themselves together. Today's church is characterized by unfaithful membership. If you look at the church covenant, does it not say, I promise to? Doesn't the word of God tell us these are what we need to do? And, and listen, if you can't do it with all your heart, if you can't do it with joy and enthusiasm and excitement, you're not doing it correctly. 
Something's missing in your heart. Something's missing in your life. Secondly, spiritual growth. Look at verse 42. And they that gladly received his word. Now notice that. They gladly received his word. And they continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. They had a desire for and a love for doctrine. And that's spiritual growth. They gladly received the word. They loved the word of God more than their, more than their necessary food for life. Job 23.12 says... Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Folks, he was saying, I love God, and I love what he says, and I love it more than eating food. In Acts chapter 17, the Berean, it said they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Here, here, listen. They were so glad to receive the word of God. They searched the word of God just in case they were missing something. And then when it got it, they were listening with great anticipation. They read the Bible because they knew they were going to get something out of it. It was exciting to them. What am I going to find today? What is God going to do for me today? What promise am I going to find? What commandment am I going to find? What exhortation am I going to find? What does God have for me today? What encouragement is there for me today? They had a desire to re receive the word of God. You get a church full of people who desire to hear God's word, whether it be Sunday school teaching or Wednesday night Bible study and prayer, or whether it be Sunday morning, whatever it is, you get a group of people that want to hear God's word, that's an exciting place to be. Yes. They not only wanted the word of God they taught and preached, they wanted to receive it with readiness of mind. All right, God, what do you want me to do? Fill my mind with your word so that I'll do what your word says. You know, it's a terrible thing to be a Christian a long time and not even know what God has called you to do. I think the Sunday school teacher said something about this morning about, you know, it's embarrassing, and I'm paraphrasing. It's embarrassing if you're a Christian for a long time and if someone asks you about the Bible, you have nothing to say. There's people who've been Christian for 20 years that are as weak in their faith as a brand new convert. And that's sad. That's a tragedy. They wanted to receive it, it says, with readiness of mind, with great anticipation, and they wanted to do it with all their might. They searched the word every day. Have you ever had the Bible in your mind every day? Have you ever opened the Bible every day and said, God, what do you want me to do? God, what's this saying to me? I know you read the Bible in observation. You get in the, the word of God, you meditate upon it. You find out what God wants you to do, and you know what? I found out every time I read the Word of God with readiness in mind, He always has something for me this day. You, have you ever read the Word of God? And you've read it hundreds of times, especially this passage hundreds of times, or whatever passage you love. And one day you're reading it and something just jumps out at you. And you say, who put that in there? Where'd that come from? I've read it hundreds of times and I didn't know it was there. Because God knew you needed what was there and you just skimmed it. The difference from reading the Word of God and skimming the Word of God. And they had a readiness of mind to get in the Word of God. They gladly divided the Word of God otherwise. They were doctrinally correct. Revelation 2.2 2 said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear those which are evil. And thou hast tried this which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. How do they know they were liars? They're in the Word. They had the Word in them. In fact, all scripture concept has to be consoled to avoid the wrong idea. Otherwise, you've got to get in the word. The word interpret, interprets the word. Listen, the word of truth must be taught honestly with nothing to be added and nothing to be deleted. We have honestly, dividing the word of the word of God means cutting straight. It's the idea of, of cutting straight, that you cut off the error, you cut off the false interpretation, you cut it straight. If God says it, it's true. If God demands it, we do it. If God is a commandment of God, we obey it. It's God's word. It's not our word. It's God's word. It's not man's word. God knows his children, and his children know him. And when God speaks to his children, this is God's love letter to us. When I was in the Marine Corps, Pam and I wrote love letters back and forth. Now, if you, Pam has saved every one of them. I had to go through and make sure I didn't say anything wrong, you know. But do you know something? If you read those love letters, you wouldn't understand them. They weren't for you. But this book is God's love letter to us. Amen. And if you're in love with God, these things mean something to you. These things help you. These things refresh you. These things give you a desire. Oh, I want to be there. And see his lovely face. I want to be right in his presence. 
I want to sense that what God is saying in his word, he's saying to me, it changes your life. And folks, it's, it, the word of God is in season and out of season. There's not a season of the year that God's word is not correct. And God's word is not needed. And every, every part of the word of God is ready for us to under, understand. We just always let the Bible interpret itself. You read the word of God, don't go to some commentary and say, what does that mean? <laughs> go to the word of God and you'll find out what it means. God never, never, the whole word of God, is nothing in the word of God is a lie. Listen, if one part, one word of the Bible is a lie, throw the whole book away. It's not true. You can't be truthful and, and what, every, once in a while, every once in a while slip in a lie. That's not being truthful. You can bank on the word of God. You can love the word of God. Folks, listen, they had a desire to fellowship. They had a desire to love. They had a desire to be like men of God. In fact, and all that believed were together. They loved each other. Galatians 4.15 says, Where is them that the blessed he speak of? For I bear you record that if it were possible, or had been possible, we would have plucked out their own eyes and given them to me. This is Paul. He had an eye problem. We don't know what it was. We don't know what type of eye problem it was, but we do know he had a hard time seeing. It seemed like almost he was going blind. Some of the letters he had someone else write it for him. But here are the Galatian people. They so loved him. And they realized he was losing his sight. Notice what it says. We wanted even to pluck our eyes out and give you sight. That's a lot of love, isn't it? That's a lot of I know that you're losing your sight. I don't know how to help you, but I'll tell you what. I'll give you my eyes. I'll give you my heart. I'll give you my arm. I'll give you my leg. Children of God so love each other, they'll sacrifice for each other. They'll lift up each other. And when there's a death in the family, a particular family, there is a death in the family of God. When a family member of a church it is hurting, the whole church hurts. And ladies and gentlemen, the opposite side of it, if a person, a member of our church, has been promoted or has been praised or has done great things and people all celebrate it, the whole church ought to celebrate it. Ought not to be jealous about someone getting something more than you do. Don't do that. And one day you'll get something better than anybody. Heaven. Heaven. When you get our heart, when you get our hearts right with God, you know what happens? We desire to be around God's people. What would you think of some if I walked up to you and say, Well, these are stupid children? <laughs> sorry. You'd say, What? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Are these your crazy children? Yeah. I don't know about you, but you wouldn't like me very much. What do you think God thinks when we put down his children? What do you think that God thinks of us when we argue with his children? We fight with his children. We talk about behind the backs of his children. What do you think of that? If God loves us so much that he died for us, he has a whole lot of love for his children than we do for ours. You know, sometimes we won't die for our children. Sometimes we want to kill our children. <laughs> now, I don't mean that literally, but there's been times in your life and my life is, honey, go get your children. I, I, I like it this way. When my children are good, they're my children. When they're bad, they're hers. Come from her side of the family. <laughs> that desire to spend time with the men of God and women of God. I love 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish them. When's the last time you said thank you to a worker in this church? When's the last time you said thank you to a Sunday school teacher? When you, when's the last time you said thank you to the ushers, to the graders? To, when's the last time you said thank you to the deacons? When's the last time you said thank you to anybody that works in this church, in the bus ministry? Let me add one thing to the bus ministry. Well, I missed it, then I must have had something. No, we need a lady. We need a man. We need a man. There's a reason. Time or the reason. But the other thing is, and by the way, young people, if you're a young man, an older teenager, I challenge you to be that man. God will use you. God will use you. And I'll tell you something, I'll marry you. I was, um, we had a large bus ministry in Copers Chapel when I was in college, I was a youth director. Uh, in fact, uh, Jackie's dad and mom, Jackie, their brother, was involved in it. We had such a large bus ministry, you couldn't even put them on the stage that came to church. And some of them are in full-time ministry today. I don't want to be like the church I pastored in, in Alabama. Don't you dare bring those snotty those children into this brand new sanctuary. Shut down that bus ministry. If that's your feeling, you don't deserve that church. 
This is no longer God's church, it's your church. Folks, God saves from the utmost to the guttermost, amen? And I'll tell you what, I'm so glad that he loved us when yet we were sinners in the worst shape. God loved us and died for us. Not when we're saved and not when we're great and not when we're good, but he loved us when we're at that worst state in life. God loved you so much he died for you. That's the God we serve, and that's the God we ought to promote, and that's the God we ought to get excited about. Aren't you glad that you know Jesus Christ? Aren't you glad that he's your Savior, and he forgave you, and he loved you so much that he died for you? Wow. Listen, they had spiritual power. How did they do that? They prayed often. They were continually with one accord in prayer, according to Acts 1, 14. I hear music. When I was teaching on Wednesday night, that lady in the Bible study said every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, her song went off with a choir singing praises to God. The first time it ever happened, I went. <laughs> but every Wednesday night, I said, Tammy, do something. Turn that phone off. Whatever. I can't get it off my phone. Well, go to a specialist. And you know what? It just kept getting louder and louder. And, louder. and every Wednesday night, I'd be teaching around 8 o'clock. I'd look over there and talk. And I knew it. It was coming. And sure enough, 8 o'clock on the door. Praise court, you know? And I said, one time I said, I'm coming, Lord. <laughs> hey, you ought to smile once in a while on Sunday morning. Let your face show it. You know it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile? Some of you got some strong jaws. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's why your cheeks are out like this. It's, you're frowning too much. Smile every once in a while. Do you good, you know? And, and as a pastor, when I look out there, I don't want you... Or, I told you before, my watch is slow. Don't do that. Listen, they gave praises to God. They gave their problems to God. They gave their perplexities to God. They gave their pressures to God. If God gets all those things, what do you have to worry about? They prayed. And then also, they prayed fervently. Look at verse chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayer, the, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. They cried out with, to God. Now the word cry out to God is different than praying to God. The Greek word for crying out to God means that you are like a person, like a little baby, uh, who's crying because he's in pain. As a mother, you know the difference between your baby who just whines and a baby that's really hurt. A baby that just whines, you've had him so often. But when that baby has that cry in that room, Crying out to God is like a drowning man. Save me! Help me, I'm drowning. I'm in problems. I, I, I got a great problem, God. I don't know what to do. You ever been there? God, it's breaking my heart. It's breaking my soul. My family, oh God, my son, my daughter, or whatever it is. God, my family's been broken up. My heart is crushed. God, help me! It's totally relying upon God. It's humbling ourselves to the point that God, if you don't answer this, I don't know what I'm going to do. A person who has pride can never cry out to God. Crying out to God means you humble yourself to the point that you're on your knees, prostrate before God, saying, God, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't even know what to do. God, I don't know if anybody can help me except you. And they were crying out to God. They knew if God was not in it, it was done. They knew if God didn't help them, everything was going to go wrong. And what they did, they gave it all to God. They literally cried out to God with reverence to speaking audibly. They were not just speaking in their, in, you know, in their mind. They, were, they didn't care who heard them. What happens to the day when we had the mourner's bench? What happened to the day when people come to the altar and they literally mourn to God? You would hear them crying out, weeping before God. Oh God, my son. Oh, God, my husband. Oh, God, my dad or my mom or whoever it was. And they were weak before the Lord. Oh, God, it's me. And the whole house was shaken because people were crying out to God. And God was answering their prayer. When's the last time we got our knees and cried out to God for our church? Last time we ever said, oh, God. It takes faith and it takes humility to share our hearts out loud before God. Listen, if we're all children of God. What does it matter what someone else did? Don't be like, you know, I have a, I have a tiny altar when people come to the altar to help someone who's coming to the altar. So I have a, have a, how to do that? How do you pray with someone? Years ago in the Baptist church, 
And Sunday morning, this lady comes to the altar. And she knelt down and she's crying. So another lady from the church comes down to her. And it's quiet. And she said, you did what? <laughs> I think that was the last time that lady ever came to the altar. That's not a good thing to do at an altar. Cry not God, this is the way that literally it's the way that our heart literally gets our concern out of our soul. In fact, this is the way we express trust in God and God's power. We literally see God's capability and willingness. Why would we cry out to someone or something that can't help us? You're wasting your breath. I've been at many times in my ministry with my wife and I have cried out to God, oh God. We're down for the count. Don't know what we're going to do. Have you ever been down? It doesn't seem like anybody's around. You ever been down? It seems like you're the only one that trusts God. You ever been in a place where you really need God? It doesn't like look like someone cares. You ever walked in a church and so burdened and so down and people shake your hand, but they don't look, look in your face and see your tears and your brokenheartedness? Oh God, give us a church that are there for the brokenhearted and there for the down and out that care enough to say, how can I help you? I've been in services. As the pastor, I didn't get to preach because we had a song service, just a simple song service. And a particular song broke the heart of a lady. She come running to the altar. It broke the heart of a man. He came and whole families came. And all I could do was go down there myself. I told you before that one time I preached a sermon and I was the first at the altar. And the church shouted for joy. You'll get that. It'll take you a while. It's true. I went to the altar. But everybody in the church said, the preacher went to the altar. It's about time. <laughs> you know why you're humble yourself before God? Because you realize he's the only one that can rescue you. He's the only one that can help you. They had unselfish giving. Ay, 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 ay. That is Greek for hurry up. They gave of themselves. Listen, in 2 Corinthians first, chapter 8, verse 5, and they, they, and this is what they did, not as we hoped, but gave first themselves to the Lord. If you don't give yourself first, you won't do anything for God. It was not about money or time or talent. It was about them. Who owned them and who brought them and what they do and who they belong to. When I realize I belong to God, it's going to make a difference in what I do. Their giving was based on their love for and commitment to Jesus Christ. And they gave their finances. You know the Bible says well, he loves a cheerful giver. I remember years ago I told a lady that played our piano and organ, I said, come here. Why do you always play funeral songs when you take up an offer? It ought to be a joyful time. Next Sunday morning, he smiled at a human. Next Sunday morning, I don't know what it was, but they sung up, they played a joyful song. And they were looking at me laughing. I'd rather give a joyful offering than a begrudging offering. If you can't give out of joy, you haven't given. I tell young people, you've not been obedient unless you've done it in the right attitude. Take out the garbage. Oh, you can't let me take out the garbage. I just can't. I don't know why I did that for one of them. I don't know why I'm not taking out the garbage. You haven't, you haven't been taking out the garbage, Lord God. If you don't do it joyfully, you haven't done it. Obedience always comes first with joy. A joyful attitude. Ah, oh, why in the world have you got me so far behind? I don't know. The spiritual, they had spiritual and they had doctrinal unity. They had unity within the church. It's 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he speak the same thing and there be no division. There was a desire to get in the word and the word to get in them. Can I ask you a real question, a real serious question? How can we say we have the mind of Christ if we're always disagreeing? How can we say we have the mind of Christ while we're arguing? Well, I have my preference. If you're a child of God, you ought to have his preference. I just passed a church for 32 years, and we never had a negative vote. Every vote was 100. Not because of me, but because of him. I've never pastored a church like that. Never. Everyone. Listen, everybody got excited. Things were happening. Things were doing. Folks, if we have the mind of Christ... And, and, and the brother has the mind of Christ, and the sister has the mind, mind of Christ, then you all have the same mind. Right. You say you, we, we shouldn't disagree, not on spiritual things, not on church things, 
if we do our homework right and we explain it right, we let people know this is God's will for us and everybody prays about it, you know what? You're going to come back and you want to do it. They were vocal worship. Oh, listen. You'll like this, Jennifer. You'll like this. They sang out loud. They opened their mouths. In fact, if you read the Psalms, it's amazing. They literally make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Make a loud noise unto the Lord. Joyce. Rejoice in the word of your voice. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. The Lord. Over and over again, it's talking about joy. Make a loud, joyful voice. Many times, church service singing is like this. I love you, Jesus. I love you so much. Same person said, I just don't like shouting. Follow him to a football game where his son is playing. Listen, he sat, I told the one guy, you hypocrite, sat beside him one day at a football game. He told me he could never scream or yell or anything. I said, what are you doing here doing that? Well, it's different. No, it's not. Make a joyful noise. What had to happen? I was at a place, there's 5,000 men with no music singing amazing you talk about tearing me up. They were all in one accord. They were singing Amazing Grace. People were raised, these men were raising their hand and crying and just singing Amazing Grace. How sweet that sound that saved a wretch like me. It tore me out of the saddle. It ought to tear us out of the saddle. Oh, man, when you think about worshiping God in song, listen, we need to be in obedience to God. Obedience to God. Charlie, they ought to sing a voice. One accord into God. Amen? Sing out loud. I, like, I love what you said about the choir behind. I listen to them too. Sometimes I just, and listen to them. I just want to hear people say. But then I, God says, what about you, Tim? And so I begin to say. There's a song written in 1948 by a Free Will Baptist, uh, Marvin Dalton, who wrote this. Oh, what a Savior. Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. I searched through heaven and found a Savior to save a poor, lost soul like me. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed and his side was driven. He gave his life's blood for you and me. Death's chilling waters I'll soon be crossing. His hands will lead me safely over. I joined the chorus in the great city and sing up there forevermore. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed scars and his side was driven. He gave his blood for you and me. Oh, they sang out loud and they sang uniform. They sang the same song together in praise for God. Not only had, but finally, they were soul winners. They went out and they won souls. You cannot shut up a Christian. You ever watch a fiancé, a, a, a man and a woman, and, and he's going to pose the question, you ever ring? You ever know? Well, hope you've married. You've been there one time. <laughs> and he gets on his knees. Huh? Yep, I don't know where that came from. And he gets on his knees, and he gives her the ring. And I think she puts it on. What does she do for weeks on end? <laughs> we had a girl at church who got an engagement ring. She said, Have you seen my ring, preacher? Oh, about a hundred times. I said, Let me see it. <laughs> I looked at her boyfriend and I said, You cheeky. <laughs> but he said, You know how much that cost? I said, Probably too cheap. And he said, Well, how much did you pay for your wife? I'm going to tell you a little, real quick. you got to get this. I was going in the Marine Corps, got engaged to my wife. I went in the Marine Corps and I got a higher bill than what the ring I was paying. I bought. My wife to be went back to the jewelry store and got a better ring. <laughs> and sent me the, that's true, honest, and sent me the bill. <laughs> I said, Do I have to pay this? And then she called me after the fact to tell me about it. Honey, it just wasn't too it was so small, and the ring was out doing the Diamond. Let it outdo the diamond. <laughs> Quickly, let me, let me close this way. If we love the Lord, we got to get involved in every phase of his ministry. We need to reach people. We need to go to nursing homes. We need to have a bus ministry. Our nursery, our children's church, our youth ministries, our young couple ministries, our college career ministries, 
the middle-aged ministries, the older ministries. We ought to be teaching and training our music ministry and all other ministries here. we got to get involved. You can't be involved in every ministry, but you can be involved in one ministry. We ought to understand this church is made and grown for ministry, to serve. It's not about us, it's about him. If it's about him, it's always about them. We need to be reaching. And the model church is not people coming here and get saved. It's the church going out there and winning to Jesus Christ and bring them in here and train them. We've got to get off our seats and get out there in the world. We should never miss an opportunity to train. If I ask you a question this morning, what are you doing? What are you doing in church? You tell me. How much training have you had there? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know why you're doing it? Do you know the purpose of that ministry? Do you know why we have listen, a ministry without a purpose does not yet need to be a ministry. Okay. Well, Charlie and I talked about the music ministry. He set me straight. That's a humble man. And he came in my office and he said, whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. And after he left, Charlie, I wept. I wept. That's a heart for God. It's not about me. It's about him. Church, listen. we got to get to the place. You don't know me. I don't really know you. But I tell you, we all, as children of God, every church got to get to the place where God is not about us. It's Teach us, train us. We want to serve you. We, we want to make an impact on you. So that for you, here's my invitation. It's very simple. It's about the church. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about First Church right here. And this is everyone individually and everyone collectively. You love God. You love His church. You love the minister? You love his people? What in your life is holding you back from being part of the ministry? What is hurting you? Someone, one, man, one lady told me one time, I'm too old. I said, I'm going to tell you when you're too old. And they put you in the coffin. But God has something for you until you go to heaven. One lady was a nurse in the home. said, Preacher, what did God have for me? I said, you're my prayer warrior. Nothing better. If you'll pray for me. I love it because God can change my life and change the church. Just be my prayer warrior. And witness around this nursing home. Let everybody know God's good. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Here's, here's the ministry. Here's the invitation. It's different. I know. God brought me here for a reason. This church is here for a reason. Are you part of that 